Hi everybody and welcome or welcome back to Murder at Bedtime. I'm sorry it's been a while but I've had the dreaded lurgy and it just won't go away. Anyway, I'm back now and raring to go. So I hope you had a great Christmas and a very happy new year to you all. As you know, this is a true crime bedtime story. No frills, no waffle, just you and me and a mic. And today we are off into the 18th century to Henley-on-Thames in Oxfordshire to tell the story of Oxfordshire's probably most famous murderess and ghost, Mary Blandy. So pop me on the bedside table, pop up your pillows, pull up your covers and listen to me trying to find out if Mary was hopelessly lovesick, a cold-blooded killer or just as thick as two short planks. So let's go back to the 18th century where we find 27-year-old Mary Blandy fast approaching old maid status for those times. Which was unusual because well-educated Mary was very bright, intelligent and charming with a lovely figure, nice face although scarred a bit by smallpox scars and she came very invitingly with a £10,000 dowry which was a fortune in those days. So why was she still unmarried? Well, it was mostly down to her father, Francis Blandy, a well-to-do lawyer in the town. Basically, he was a bit of a snob, although also caring father, and was looking for a top husband, hopefully part of nobility, for his daughter. Also, he didn't actually have a £10,000 dowry to give out. His entire wealth totalled about £4,000. But of course, nobody knew that at the time. Which, as you can imagine, when he had to tell the would-be suitor the truth, when an applicant had been found that had ticked all his boxes and agreed to marry Mary, did not go down too well. Hence... Mary was on her way to becoming a spinster. Thinking they needed to widen their net, Mary and her mother, also called Mary, spent seasons in London and Bath, socialising and attending society balls. But it was while attending a party in Little Old Henley that she was introduced to Captain the Honourable William Henley Cranston. Cranston, who was absolutely nothing to write home about, 12 years older than Mary, he was described as diminutive in stature, of a very mean aspect, and so disfigured by the smallpox as to have his face full of seams. So it must have been his charm that won Mary over, and the fact that he did come from nobility. He was the fifth son of a Scottish peer and was linked with all kinds of noble families. Also, quite how he had gotten away with fighting for the Jacobites at Culloden against the Crown and now was high up in the King's Marines, I have no idea. Now, I think Mary's father should have weighed up things here a bit better and realised the fifth son of a lord wasn't going to be picking up more than mere morsels from his father's estate. But Mary was dazzled by the captain, and so was Francis for a while, and his wife was absolutely gaga for the not so dashing gentleman. Anyway, by 1747, Cranston had also come round to the same way of thinking and was declaring his passion for Mary. They met and went for long walks whenever the captain was able, and they decided to become engaged. But as the big 30th birthday drew closer for Mary, she was still unmarried. Then a bombshell. Francis Blandy received a letter from Lord Mark Kerr, a very respected member of the nobility. Not only was it Lord Mark's party that Mary originally met Cranston, but also Cranston was his great nephew. Now, news had reached the ears of Lord Mark that his nephew had become betrothed to Francis's daughter. 
and was just sending him a little note out of common decency and respect to inform him that his rascal of a great nephew was indeed already married. In fact, he had been married since 1745 to a local girl called Anne Murray in Scotland, and they had a daughter together. Now, as you can imagine, Francis Blandy was spitting feathers and summoned Cranston to see him. But the Honourable Captain stayed very cool under questioning and answered that, no, he wasn't married. It was true that he had been engaged to this lady, but they couldn't marry because he was a Protestant and her a Catholic. And she would have had to change faith for the marriage to take place. But she refused to do so. There was no child and his great uncle just wanted to cause trouble due to a long-standing family feud. Everything was in the hands of the Scottish court and would be sorted out very soon. Now Francis Blandy wasn't a fool and he was also a lawyer and he wanted no more to do with the match but Cranston took off to London to take care of his affairs and Mary and her mother, who were still well and truly in the captain's camp, followed as Mary's mother wasn't feeling at all well and went to London to seek medical advice. To stay at home, at the home of an uncle, who made it very clear that Cranston was not welcome in his house and consequently Mary had to make plans to meet Cranston in the house of an acquaintance. Mary and her mother returned to Henley in 1749, but unfortunately Mrs. Blandy died on the 20th of September of that year. The reason given being intestinal inflammation. But afterwards, many thought that Mary may have murdered her mother. Now, in my opinion, that makes no sense at all, as Mary's mother was her and Cranston's biggest ally. Cranston continued to visit Mary in Henley, but her father was no longer interested in him as a suitor. No news was forthcoming about his marriage to Anne Murray, and he spent long hours in the coffee houses of Henley trying to avoid the man. It was at this point that Cranston could see the non-existent £10,000 dowry slipping through his fingers. And he told Mary that he knew a cunning woman up in Scotland who knew how to make love potions. Just a few spoonfuls in her father's tea or food would miraculously restore his good feelings towards the captain. And to prove his point, he apparently brought some down on his next visit. Mary mixed some with Francis's tea and miraculously his mood towards Cranston was improved for the rest of the day. But when Cranston returned once again to Scotland, Mary's father told her the captain could not return to the house until the matter of his other wife had been resolved. What Francis didn't know is that up in Scotland, Cranston's appeal had failed. And not only did he by law now have a wife and daughter, he was also ordered to pay alimony. So he could never marry Mary while Anne was alive. So it's a bit confusing as to why Cranston continued sending the love potions to Mary in the guise of cleaning powder to clean some Scottish peebles he had sent her. Now, these peebles, or pebbles, were quite the rage in these times, apparently, as ornaments. Unless he thought getting rid of the father and Mary being an only child and inheriting everything, he could charm the money out of her without even marrying her. We will never know. So Mary, apparently, under Cranston's instructions, is now liberally mixing these potions from an envelope labelled cleaner for the peoples. Now, did that not set off any alarms in Mary's head? When her father is visibly becoming very sick after eating and drinking, so are we supposed to believe that this poor love-struck woman who has had a top private education and is very intelligent is cluelessly mixing in a harmless love potion to her father's meals? 
Now I've got to say, I'm not really buying it. On one occasion, one of the servants, Sally Gunnell, finished off the dish of tea that her master had left and she was violently sick for three days. And on another day, another servant, Anne Emmett, finished off a bowl of gruel, which was oatmeal mixed with water, that Francis left and became so ill she nearly died. By now, Francis Blandy was also very ill and the servants were suspicious, but the very switched on Sally or Sue Gunnell, I can't tell which one, I've heard of them both called, same Christian name, Sally or Susan, examined the pan. The gruel was made in and found a gritty white sediment in it. Now, she locked it in a closet overnight and the next day took it to a neighbour, Mrs Mountney, who got the local apothecary or pharmacist, Mr Norton, to take it for testing. Now, Sally, or Sue Gummel, decided after consulting his brother to tell her master her suspicions. Now, I think we can all agree that Sally, or Susan, was wasted as a servant. Even though he had probably tried to deny it to himself that the daughter that he loved, that he had always done as much as he could for, was trying to kill him, the realisation now really struck home. At breakfast the next morning, Francis confronted his daughter while drinking his tea. He fixed her with a stare and commented that it had a bad, gritty taste and asked Mary if she had put anything in it. Clearly unsettled, Mary rushed upstairs, retrieved some letters and the powders and threw them onto the kitchen fire. Presumably she then scurried out of the kitchen because the quick thinking servants managed to save some of the powder from the fire. As her father became more ill, Mary was forced to call for a doctor, Dr Addington from Reading, who had treated her mother. After examining Francis and being told his symptoms, Dr Addington was sure Francis Blandy was being poisoned with arsenic. As he went to leave, Sally, aka Susan Gunnell, pressed the envelope of powder saved from the fire into the doctor's hand. He tasted a tiny bit and he knew it was arsenic. The apothecary, Mr Norton, also gave him some of the powder from the pan he had been given, which the doctor took home to test further. Before he went and after speaking to the servants, he approached Mary and told her, if your father dies, you will be ruined. The doctors now confined Mary to her room with a guard on the door and she was banned from going to her father's sickbed. Until Francis said he wished to see her so he could forgive her and help to bring the villain Cranston to justice. When told a letter from her to the captain had been intercepted and some of the powder she threw on the fire had been rescued, she threw herself to her knees begging for forgiveness but still sticking to the story about the love potion. Of course, he did forgive her and believed that she didn't mean to harm him, but was under the spell of Captain Cranston. That was the last time that Mary saw her father because on the morning of Wednesday the 14th of August 1751, in great agony, Francis Blandy passed away. Now, forensic evidence was in its infancy, but some strides had been made in testing for some poisons, especially arsenic. The post-mortem was carried out by Dr Addington, Dr Lewis, the apothecary Mr Norton and a surgeon Edward Nicholas, where the organs were found to contain high levels of arsenic. Dr Addington had also done his tests on the powder, supposedly the cleaner for the Scottish pebbles and found that placing it on a hot iron made the powder rise in thick white flumes rather than flaming and smelt of garlic, just like arsenic. 
The coroner, after hearing all of the evidence and listening to the statements from the doctors and servants, concluded that Francis Blandy had been poisoned and that Mary, his daughter, was responsible for the murder. Now, parricide, the murder of your father, was considered the heinous crime of which the only sentence was death. The day after her father's death, conflicting reports say that Mary, who was basically under house arrest and being guarded by the parish clerk and old flame, Ed Hearn, took advantage of the fact that Ed was called away to dig Francis's grave. Yes, really. And Mary took the opportunity to make her escape or take a stroll round the town, whichever it was you believed. Whichever it was, the now very unpopular Mary was spotted and soon a crowd was chasing after her over Henley Bridge. Seeing her predicament, the kindly landlady of the Little Angel Inn summoned her inside and gave her sanctuary from the mob. Later, under the cover of darkness, she was smuggled back to her home in a covered carriage. The next day, Mary was arrested and taken to Oxford Castle Jail, where she was treated better than the average inmate, with a comfortable cell, a maid, her own food, and she was allowed to wander around the governor's garden. She did have some dainty, discreet shackles around her ankles, but all in all, quite a pleasant stay. She spent the time between her arrest and the trial writing her own account of her affair with Captain Cranston and corresponding with another alleged murderess, Elizabeth Jeffries, who was awaiting trial. Now, I hope to cover her story soon. Mary came to trial at the Oxford Assizes on the 3rd of March 1752 before the magnificently named judges, the Honourable Hennage Legg, Esquire and Sir Stanley Stafford Smythe. Apparently she defended herself with intelligence and zeal, but the jury just couldn't believe that this bright and intelligent lady didn't know that these dodgy powders that she was mixing into her father's food weren't harming him. And after a 13 hour trial, they did not even leave the courtroom, deliberating only five minutes before finding her guilty of murder. She was removed back to Oxford Castle Jail, where she was given a few weeks for appeals and then to get her affairs in order. But no reprieve was forthcoming. On the day of her execution, on the 6th of April, 1742, Mary went to her end very bravely. It is said a crowd of around 5,000 arrived to watch the execution. Many were in tears, won over by the way she conducted herself, and the crowd, unlike most execution crowds, were very respectful and subdued. The execution itself took place in the open space outside the castle or on the mound on Westgate. The gallows was a beam placed between two trees. Remember, the long drop method had not been used yet, so it was a short drop and slow strangulation she faced. She basically had to walk up a few steps up a ladder, and when she was ready, she would give a sign and the hangman would turn the ladder over. As she approached the ladder, she is reported as saying, for the sake of decency, gentlemen, don't hang me high not wanting people to look up her skirts while she was hanging. As it happened, she lost consciousness very quickly and didn't feel the pain of strangling slowly. As the law against convicted murderers being denied burial on consecrated ground was basically still weeks away, Mary missed it and was buried between her mother and father in Henley Churchyard. As for Cranston, he, with the help of family, was secretly squirrelled away to France as soon as Mary was arrested and died of natural causes just some eight months after Mary's execution. The thing that probably could have got Mary off were the letters that Cranston wrote to her 
that she unfortunately burnt and the letters to the captain that he had kept and were found after his death in no way proved she was trying to kill her father. Now I'm hoping to do a walk around Henley and Oxford for the YouTube channel to show the sites linked to this story and the places where Mary is reported to haunt. So watch out for that. Now I would be very interested to hear what you think. So please, if you are listening on the podcast, please message me on Murder at Bedtime with Lyndon Instagram page. And if you're watching on here, on YouTube, please use the comments down below. It's always great to hear from you and I will see you for the next one. Oh, by the way, if you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up. And if you this is your first time here, please subscribe and ding the little bell for further notifications. And thank you, everybody, for your continued support. And I hope you continue to have a good year. And hopefully I will get another one out very soon. Anyway, take care of yourself. See you soon.